Hi everyone, so I'm Yaela and I'm coming from Israel and I'm very impressed and uh, inspired by this conference, so thank you very much. Um, and in Israel I grew up and I uh, work in a city called Haifa. Um, and it's uh, built on the Carmel Mountain, which you can see here, and similar to Australia. Uh, we have lots of beaches. Um, so here are a few pictures, just to get uh, sort of a, a sense of it. Um, but we also uh, have this. And Haifa has the biggest industrial area in the country. And according to the Environmental Protection Agency in Israel, uh, it's the most sensitive area uh, in terms of air quality in the country. And uh, Haifa was chosen to be one of seven cities for the FP7 uh, framework, uh, the European framework, um, called CitySense for developing sensor-based citizen observatories for improving air quality in cities. So throughout the project, air sensors, such as the ones uh, in the pictures here, uh, were distributed across the cities. Uh, and the data um, was transmitted automatically to databases uh, for two purposes. The first was for scientists to use for modeling air quality throughout the cities. And the second was uh, for participants to get awareness of the data and the air quality uh, in the areas of their residents. So through citizens, city sense, uh, for example, we learned uh, that residents in Haifa believe the air quality is quite poor. Now, it was interesting to realize that this wasn't the case only in Haifa, but rather uh, it wasn't significantly, significant, significantly different uh, than many other countries um, and cities across Europe. So you can see, for example, uh, Barcelona or um, <clears throat> Uh, Belgrade that have sort of similar uh, distributions um, such as Haifa. And moving forward after um, CitySense uh, was terminated, uh, we developed uh, our own project called Sensing the Air, and we developed it in three separate directions. The first uh, was a data presentation platform where we facilitated air quality information to the public. So this is governmental um, a monitoring uh, that are in theory open to the public but first of all they don't know where it is and even if they knew where it is they can't really interpret it if they're not air quality experts so we um, facilitate all the data and we built this platform using a user-centered design approach. Uh, the second um, uh, aspect was public uh, reports on air quality. So this was complementary data. People could um, add, you know, I see uh, some kind of air quality or I breathe, I'm smelling some kind of uh, hazard. So report and that all those reports would be added to the map uh, and also go to scientists so they can better understand sort of the air quality hazards uh, and emission sources. And finally, the third aspect, which is what is going to be the emphasis of the talk today, uh, is what we call personal sensing, uh, where people uh, got small mobile devices that they could borrow for limited amounts of times and sort of do their own personal research uh, with these monitors. So personal sensing is uh, open-ended participation uh, where people can investigate their own interests in their own local environment. and. The, the investigations are sort of relevant to what they feel and to their day-to-day -day lives. And it's based on sort of an interaction between the co-created citizen science, so the more collaborative uh, approaches, uh, and what's called citizen inquiry, where people are the ones that are guiding the inquiry from beginning to end. Uh, and the idea is to introduce personal research into citizen science. So the goals of the research that I'm presenting today was first of all to understand what interests the public. So what kind of investigations they're interested in, um, in, in doing. And then to sort of see what the skills and what their abilities are in doing this kind of research. Because we're sort of giving them the monitors and they can do whatever they want with it and analyze the data in whatever way they want. So we really were interested to see what they're doing with it and how they're analyzing the data. And the last thing was sort of to determine, based on that information, how to help them in the future to better do these analysis and these uh, investigations. 
So in order to participate, there was only um, one thing they needed to do, one requirement, which was to answer uh, four basic, basic questions. Uh, we call them investigation reports. Uh, and these questions were, what did you investigate? How did you do it? What did you find? And what are your conclusions? So these four questions correlate to what you would generally find in a scientific report or scientific paper, which is introduction, methods, results, and conclusions. Um, and so using this, we were able to sort of understand uh, what the scientific um, approach and what the scientific um, skills that people were using throughout uh, their process. We also used um, interviews and feedback surveys and correspondences with people. I had very close relationships to almost all the people who participated, so there were ongoing emails um, all the time. Um, <clears throat> So what did people investigate? Um, I must say it was very diverse and people had some really great ideas. Uh, a lot of people investigated things that are going on in their house, so differences between different rooms in their houses. Uh, there were two people who examined houses in different neighborhoods because they were in sort of an attempt, in a, in an attempt to decide what the air quality was in different neighborhoods in order to then buy a house in a place where they believed um, would be better air quality. Uh, people examined air quality in the kitchen while cooking, um, on the train or public transportation on their way to work or on their way to taking their kids to school. Uh, and we had a few teachers that uh, examined different locations uh, within the schools, some of them with students, some of them on their own. And so why did people participate? Here we also found uh, big diversity. Um, some people were just really interested in air quality and just wanted to do lots of experiments and were really excited. Uh, so this um, guy, he told me just a day or two after we met for the first time, he said, this week I thought of several experiments I could execute with the sensor. And a few days later when he got his thoughts kind of in mind, he said, first I will do an experiment to see if the sensor works when it's not connected to Bluetooth. I also want to measure the air quality near uh, car exhaust and at home with and without air filtration. So these are lots of experiments and he in the end produced five different reports with five different experiments he did. He I think did lots of others who, which he didn't report to me. Uh, but so these people that were just really really interested and really just engaged in, in just investigating whatever. Um, there were people who were, I call them the environmentalists, because they engaged um, in order to create a better environment. So this uh, participant, she told me, I'm very upset about air quality in Haifa. I go to demonstrations and I'm very active. I am a social environmental activist. As I said, we had some teachers that investigated um, using our sensors. Um, this teacher, he wrote me an email sort of out of nowhere. Uh, I guess he, he heard from a friend of a friend about the project and he said, I am a science teacher interested in measuring air pollution in school environments. I will be happy for any help. Later, when he was already involved in the project with his students, he, he wrote to me, the students are doing all the work, counting cars and measuring air sensors, measuring with the sensors. I only upload the data to the computer. So he was really engaged in order to get his students to engage. Uh, he also told me that he really wanted his kids, his, his students, um, to be involved in kind of unique and um, real, real life kind of experiment. Um, finally, there were the people who were just worried about their environment. They hear in the media all kinds of things about air pollution. They just want to know what the situation really is. So this participant told me, we don't know what the real situation is. We don't have access to real data. We just want to know what the level of pollution is here, where we put the device, meaning in his home. So these were sort of the four types of people or motivations that got people to participate. Now, going back um, into the how, so what did, these were the ideas that people had, but how did they then um, perform uh, the investigation? So these were the uh, four questions they had to answer, and we analyzed this using the next, next generation uh, sci science standards practices. So we basically um, 
took these four questions and uh, found the practice that um, is appropriate. So for example, for the question, uh, what did you investigate, um, corresponds to the practice asking questions and defining problems. So this also means asking a question asking a question, uh, uh, deciding what to investigate. So we saw from the previous slide that people knew what they want to investigate. But also asking a question that can be answered with the methods of the project. So for example, asking a question about what the implications, the health implications um, of air quality is, is not a question that can be answered by this method. Therefore, it doesn't, it, sh it shows that the, uh, the practice isn't uh, completely um, uh, used or um, that's, that skill isn't um, completely, a completely answered um, by this. So here's an example. This is in Hebrew, I'm sorry, but I will uh, translate the important part. So this is uh, an example uh, for a report we got. This was um, a guy who um, looked in the kitchen when he was cooking. You can see back there the air quality device. Yeah. Us. Um, and when we asked him, what did you want to examine, he had ver two very specific questions. His questions were, um, are there any pollutants that are emitted during uh, this process? And if so, how long does it take in order for them to um, distribute? Um, then he talked about control and replication. So he said, I did this a few times. And uh, he said that he also measured uh, about an hour or two hours before he started in order to have you know, some kind of reference uh, to compare to. He talked about the limitations of the study. He said, we can't quantify the amount of gas that is burned. Um, so, so those are some of the limitations of the study. Um, and he indicated very specifically the location, the time, the environment. He told me I opened a window, I closed a window. So it was very, um, very specific. Um, then he gave a very detailed description of the results. He also provided some um, graphs and information okay, um, that I didn't include here because I had to get everything into the slide. Um, and he had two conclusions that corresponded exactly to the research questions. And finally, he gave suggestions for further investigation. So this is a very good report, very um, uh, um, sort of shows really the use of all the practices uh, that are relevant in the context of uh, of the report, uh, but unfortunately, not all of the reports we got um, showed the use of all the practices. Um, my most extreme example was a report where the conclusion actually contradicted the results. Uh, they proved the initial hypothesis, but they discarded basically the evidence. So that shows. Uh, Yes, um, so, so the practice engaging an argument from evidence obviously was, um, uh, was not evident there, but the practices sort of intervene with each other. So the reason he did not get the, the last practice right was because the, the problems or the difficulty he had in analyzing and interpreting the data and in sort of um, uh, mixing or synthesizing the different data sets that he, that he had. Um, so I believe that sort of understanding these limitations could help us then scaffold for these problems so we detect where exactly the problems are in the investigations that people conduct um, so we could um, further um, develop the project in these kinds of directions. So uh, these are a few of the things, so multiple opportunities for participants uh, that are tailored to the needs of diverse communities, um, diverse uh, educational backgrounds, uh, but still leaving these personal research interests so people could, you know, people um, investigate the things that are interest to them and relevant to their lives. Um, while we design scaffolding for this process um, in order to produce reliable data and reliable conclusion drawing. Um, and this is our goal, transforming citizen science into what citizens want it to be. So thank you.